I'm Linda Laurel, creator and host of Our Voices Matter. Why this podcast and why now? Because it's time for us all to take a deep breath and listen. I am a journalist, business owner, keynote speaker, founder of an education nonprofit, wife, mother, daughter, sister, dancer, and lover of life, and my country. And like so many of you, I am deeply distressed at the deteriorating level of discourse in our democracy. This podcast is my humble attempt to do something about it, one story at a time. It is my hope that as you listen to and watch the stories of someone you might consider to be the other, that you will somehow see a glimpse of yourself and be reminded of our common humanity. So what do you say? Let's take this journey together. Welcome to Our Voices Matter, a podcast dedicated to empowering us all to better understand each other. Our goal, to replace fear with knowledge, disdain with respect, and hate with love, one story at a time. So let's get to it. I don't even know where to begin with this next guest. First of all, we've been friends for a very, very, very long time. And I guess we met Rusty Harden when I was a news anchor at Channel 2, KPRC. Very good news anchor. Well, thank you very much. I paid him to say that. Um, and we just have become friends through the years. And um, watching your career has really been um, exciting and extraordinary. Um, a lot of people will know who you are because you have handled some very high profile cases in your career, but that's not where you started, is it? No, no, actually I started everything in my life late. I was 29 when I got married. I was 31 before I started law school, 34 when I became a lawyer. And I was 49 when I went into private practice as opposed to 25 or 26. So. I started out as a lawyer, as a prosecutor for over 15 years here in Harris County. And why did you decide to go into private practice? It was time. I mean, Johnny Holmes was the DA. He was a friend. I thought he was a good DA. I wasn't going to run against him. And there really wasn't anything else left position or whatever in the office. And you reach a certain stage where you think, you know, maybe I don't want to work for somebody else anymore. Maybe I'll try it on my own. So it was a combination of things. Um, I loved that time there. I tell people I was never asked to prosecute somebody that I didn't think was guilty because of who they were. Uh, and I uh, was never asked to, uh, to, to do anything that I didn't agree with or believe in. So it was a great time and I enjoyed it, but it was time to try a new chapter. And that new chapter has um, given you, as I said, a lot of high profile cases. So to name a few, um, Arthur Anderson, uh, Roger Clemens, Calvin Murphy, um, J. Howard Marshall, Anna Nicole was not your favorite person, or she, you were not her favorite we didn't person, right? We didn't exchange <laughs> Christmas cards. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and many, many more. So how do you handle um, sort of being in the spotlight to the, de to the degree that you are with the kinds of cases that you handle? You know, I don't notice being in the spotlight. Uh, uh, you know, I grew up with two incredible parents who didn't even graduate from high school. Certainly didn't go to college. Town was 9,000 in North Carolina. If I ever started thinking I was a, a big deal or acting like I was a big deal, I think I'd probably hear from them. And, um, and so I don't really notice that part. I'm, I'm surprised if somebody comes up and recognizes to say hello. I, I don't understand why people have been lucky enough to have a public, some public awareness why they resent it and why they feel infringed upon. Mm -hmm. I, I'm actually, uh, I'm complimented if somebody comes up and wants to say hello or wants to do it. So I don't quite understand when people pick a public life or in my case, trying cases, which is in public, I don't quite understand their, their feeling of imposition of the very people they're making their living off of. You mentioned growing up, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about your backstory because uh, I would imagine that some people who just heard you kind of, you know, offhandedly say, you know, never went to college, yada, yada. Tell us more. They would be surprised because they probably have an idea. Of well, they were, they were incredible people. My mother was one of 13 children in Atlanta. She grew up in the first public housing project in Atlanta. 
Uh, they, uh, they were products of the recession. So they were part of that generation in many ways that Tom Brokaw was always writing about. And they, uh, they devoted their entire life to their children. So their goal was to give their children things they didn't have. And so it was a very middle, light, middle class, but we, we didn't want or anything. And, and as you know, those of us who grow up in non-wealthy environments, we don't know that we're, we're not getting certain things other people do. So I had a, a very, very pleasant childhood and a wonderful time. Uh, Monroe, North Carolina is near Charlotte. Uh, North Carolina was a great state to grow up in. Um, and so I, I, I had, didn't have a life of deprivation. I had a great middle-class life growing up. But I tell people the advantage of a small town is, is, is that you have a much bigger cross-section of people that you grow up with. For instance, I grew up in an era of segregation, but I didn't know that I was supposed to think that black kids and I were different because we all played together up to five or six because you had interspersed housing in this month. And then all of a sudden, one day, without realizing it, I was back in an all-white world. And in a, a small town, though, brings you into contact with a greater variety of people and backgrounds. There's not this artificial by income or by race segregation. I mean, race, when I grew up, was a segregation, but not income strata. So I tell people, if you want to be a trial lawyer, grow up in a small town. Huh. It's the best, best training in the world. So you say you found yourself back in an all-white world after the age of six or, or whatever. Um, what kind of an impact do you think that, that had on you in terms of your view of the world as you went out into it? Well, I had parents that never drew a distinction around the dining room table or so. Uh, they, of course, were the products of a very conservative white background, segregated background. One of, um, but... You know, that somehow it never registered to me, even though I grew up in an all-white world. Uh, one of my best friends is Gene Locke. And Gene Locke and I uh, talk here a lot about how we had parallel, separate lives growing up. Gene Locke, African-American attorney wonderful, in Houston. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful guy, wonderful friend. Mickey Leland's first chief of staff when Mickey Leland went to Congress. Um, but we grew up in segregated worlds, and we talk about it like we even talk one time about teaching a class or a course as a guest of somebody as to how he's growing up in Marshall, Texas. The first white person he ever went to school with was at the University of Houston. The first black person I ever went to school with was at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, where I went. And so, you know, we both went through these worlds that uh, were in our early formative years society set us about apart. And then, because of parent, maybe our parents or someone in our background, uh, the merging of the real world was not traumatic for us at all. That's such a beautiful story um, to tell because, it, for a couple reasons. One, it, it, it shows you the importance of the, of the impact that a parent can have on a oh. child in terms of their, you know, how they how they view the world, particularly when it comes to things like race. Um, but also, it, it shows how, how people from different backgrounds can find commonality, um, even if they've, they've not been exposed to the other. Tell me, if, was there ever um, a time in your life when you felt like the other? Where you felt like you had been shunned or you didn't fit in? No, it's, but, but, but it's a real good question because it's only happened occasionally and it'd be a passing event of several hours. For example? It wouldn't, uh, yeah. Well, you go to a party where you're the only white person there because the African community in this town has been incredibly good to me. From the time I was a prosecutor here, I came down here and uh, for some reason, uh, I feel like uh, the African American community in this town and I've always clicked, whether it was because of clients whether it was because of peer lawyers or whatever. So that would mean that as time went on, I'd be in social situations where I was in the minority for It's similarly to uh, my wife and I um, have a lot of gay friends. And there have been occasions where we might be the only heterosexual couple at a party of like 12, 14. And, and it, the funny thing is, is, is that it, it's, it's something everybody should go through because 
you know, we don't live in the skin of a minority. And so we don't experience things the way a minority, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whatever it is. So yes, I have, but I was always going to go back to an environment where I was the majority. So it's not a real feeling, right? right? right. But it's a good reminder. So um, I let me give you an example real quickly, mm -hmm. and this is not in response to any question. No, please. <laughs> the uh, the kneeling at professional football. I wrote a letter to the Chronicle uh, praising uh, uh, Greg Popovich of, of the San Antonio Spurs because Popovich is always been a sort of an outlier in his willingness to express opinions and take strong positions. And when the needling was going on, um, and the president was, was doing what he does uh, so unattractively so many times of pitting people against each other, um, I wrote, uh, and somebody, I've forgotten what the situation was. Oh, I think what it was is Popovich gave an interview. And, and he said in that interview, you know, um, that we, we will never be able to really, uh, to really uh, talk about race meaningfully until white America realizes they were, and accepts that they were born on third base. And, and it was a great, great phrase. So I write this letter um, commending him. And the point was, is I've said, you know, you, and I set out what my background, which was, whether it's in the army or, or whatever, you know, the son is a police officer. And all. So, so I, I look at kneeling with the flag, and I spent five years in the army, and part of the time was in Vietnam. So, I look at it as a white father of a white police officer, having and I having served in the military. So, when people talk about kneeling, that's the perspective that I look at. These ball players and others that are pro patient, they look at it from the perspective of a member of a race that feels they've always been wrongly treated frequently by law enforcement, whose members of their community have been the victims of, of what in some cases clearly is police misconduct, other times may not be, but looks like it at first. Right. So I said, you know, we, we look at these, the kneeling from two different perspectives. I look at it from the perspective of a majority person uh, who's had the benefits of all these things and who's very defensive about having a son as a police officer who I very much support, and having been a prosecutor in the criminal justice system for over 15 years. That's not the perspective the people kneeling come at it from. And so my point of the letter was is that's the basis for a conversation, not the condemnation by somebody who chose not to, to serve to begin with. And so, you know, that all of those kind of experiences have a lot to do with my view of, uh, of life and the, all the good fortune. I suffer from what I call white man's guilt. And I suffer from the advantages of being in the majority and growing up that way and all of those prevented. So maybe I'm just defensive about the good fortune I've had and therefore I don't never want to forget, but that has a lot to do with who I am. I'm so glad you, you brought up the, the subject of the, uh, the ball players taking a knee um, and, and the perspective that they have in making the decision to do that. And that it's not about disrespecting the flag, as, as President Trump has said many, many times. And, and many people in this country do believe that, that it's about disrespecting the flag. Um, and they don't realize that when, when this whole thing first began, that one of the people who suggested that that was a, um, a respectful way of showing their um, displeasure with what was going on was a veteran. The person who, who actually suggested that is a yeah. veteran. So it's not, about, it's not about the disrespect of the flag, it's about acknowledging what is going on. And, and as you so eloquently just stated, coming at it from different perspectives and being willing to, um, rather than, than, than judge from where you're sitting, to try and put yourself in that position. Yeah, see, see uh, my view is, is, is that Kaepernick and others picked the wrong vehicle to make that protest. So, that, so I sit here as somebody who believes in trying to make the points they were making. It was the wrong thing because it was 
it was destined to produce the strong reaction that it did, and as a result, the message and the thing they were concerned with get lost. But that didn't mean I didn't that I thought less of them for doing it. It didn't mean that they didn't have the right to do it. I had the right to disagree and say, okay, this, there's another way to do this. However, what they would say to you is, look, this is the only way the public looks at us. And so we have this public, we have the benefit of a public position, but it all works off of football or basketball or whatever. So we've picked the milieu that people are going to look at us in. And, and there's some legitimacy there. But I think, unfortunately, because there were a lot of people that wanted to scream and yell and take advantage of, of being an, having an opportunity to condemn it, that the message got lost. And I, I think, you What know, would have been a, a better alternative in your view? Oh, that's a good point. So who, where else would they listen to them? Exactly. That, and, and that's no, why. And that's, I mean, I'm, and I'm asking a, a real question there. I mean, what, I, never, I, I get your point I, and it's a point well taken, but what would have been the alternative? I, it, I never got there. Yeah. I never, mm -hmm. I never got to where I tried to figure out the other solution because I didn't want to prevent them from doing what they were doing. Right. So it wasn't necessary. Right. Uh, I, I think that it, it, a lot of people forget the issue was almost dead before the president decided to demagogue it. Well, there have been All a right. lot of issues that have been yeah. almost dead before the president decided to demagogue it. So we yeah. just lost half yeah. of your blog audience. <laughs> uh, well, no, I and I hope not, because, yeah. you know, here's the point. So, you know, you're expressing your opinion. Um, I, um, you know, will be interviewing people that have the exact opposite opinion, and that is the point, that we have to be able to be willing to listen with an open mind to hear someone else's point of view before you jump in and say, no, 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 no. Well, that, and that was the only point I was writing in the letter, many in the letters of the Chronicle. It was a praising of, 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 uh, of a man that has accomplished a lot, having the guts to say, you know, we, with our background, need to remember the advantages we started with. And so until we are willing to do that and then turn around and listen to the other side and try to look at it and listen to it, their perspective, when people are criticizing the police, I, I instinctively come to their defense because I, I believe in them very strongly. I was very fond of them when I was a prosecutor. I worked very closely. And then my, more than anything, my son's a police officer. Where's your son a police officer for the here, audience who doesn't know? Here in Houston. Here in Houston, in Houston, HPD. For 18 years. Yeah. And, and then our older son is a school teacher. I feel the same way when people criticize school teachers. I, but at the end of the day, all of these things ought to be an open mind to the other side of what the issue. Do some police officers do something wrong? Absolutely. Do they do a lot of good? You betcha. The same thing with all every profession. And so I, I regretted the way everybody reacted to the kneeling because the message they were trying to convey got lost. Mm -hmm. And that was important. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about how we um, come together as, as a nation? Because we are having such a difficult time doing what you and I are talking about right now, which is listening to each other um, without demonizing, um, just based on what you're seeing and hearing as you go about you know, your life in the community, you're, you're very active in a lot of different things. And then in your, in your work, what are, what are you hearing um, that people uh, are, are most concerned about and, and how can we take steps to address the concerns and come together? I have no idea. Mm. You know, I, I, listening and not demonizing, I mean, you, you're absolutely right that that's the first step. It's almost like we got to ride this storm out. You know, we just, we just had an election and both sides, you know, there, but if we look carefully around some of the people that won, uh, there is that message this time. It's not the dominant message because the two extremes are too busy yelling and screaming at each other. You know, I come in as a history major and I started out as a history teacher. Our oldest son, as I told you, is a school teacher, teaches history. I, I tend to look at these things as cycles historically. This is a rough cycle right now because we're so mean-spirited toward each other. 
But if we go back and look at historically at, at the way people wrote and talked at the turn of the century, if we look at the Civil War, the, the, how strongly things were, we got to have some kind of historical perspective and in our own lives, just be willing to listen to the other side without thinking they're horrible. One of the problems now is, is that it's gotten so mean spirited on whichever direction you come from that we are socially kind of reluctant in a lot of areas to talk about social issues for fear of the other side feel so strongly. We won't have a conversation and people will start really being upset. I, this is a bad time in the sense of how strongly people feel. But I, I try to remind myself one reason is there was a sizable body of opinion in this country that felt like they were not, not only not being listened to, but were being patronized and looked down on. And I think where we misjudged is how deep and intense that feeling, that feeling was of was. being excluded. And still is in And many still cases. is. Yes. And, and, and actually, I try to remember my parents who were very conservative. My father uh, campaigned around the state of North Carolina for Jesse Helms, one of the most conservative senators we ever had. And I know my mother and father felt that their views were not taken seriously and they were patronized and they were looked at and that they were considered out of the mainstream by large portions of the country. So, so much of the people that rose up in 16 are people that I grew up with. Uh, and so I, I understand that. I just want both sides to come back to a, a more civil way of discussing it. And I think we just have to be patient. So what kind of conversations do you have with your friends who are more on the conservative side? I don't. I don't because right now, look, I think we forget sometimes where, you know, how strong and dominant the establishment was in this country and what became sort of the views that were accepted uh, and ran government and stuff. But now they finally have their day in the sun a little bit and, and they're enjoying it. And and I'm not sure that there's anything that, that I can say that is going to change. I mean, they're they're getting their their run right now. They've they've been without and now they've got. And have you I lost have you lost friends over this? Uh, no, but I could tell I would if we talked much. Really? So I just avoid the subject. All right. I have some very, very good friends who have different points of view than I. And contrary to the uh, to the TV focus groups where, you know, a, a, where you have this reporter wants to say, I really want to know what y'all feel. How do y'all feel about Trump? Well, they feel the way they feel. And by the way, <laughs> they see through you when you try to have one of these shows. <laughs> and, and so at the end of the day, I think we've reached a stage where we don't talk about these things. Everybody says we got to talk about them. I think we kind of let everything simmer down a little bit and everybody go through their lives and do what they they think uh, they feel comfortable with their values. But don't try to correct the other guys and don't try to change their mind. I think people's feelings are a little still too raw. You don't think you can have conversations where um, you're you're talking and um, expressing your point of view, but not necessarily trying to change the other person's mind. You can, but but the problem is right now. I think the feelings are too raw. I, I just I haven't had any circumstances where the end, evening ended well. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe because you know we all yeah. have strong feelings, right. and so right. I, I'm sort of just trying to stay away from it. That's um, so interesting. So. Um, Lou, my husband, whom you know, mm -hmm. um, loves having conversations with his conservative friends. And he had one just last night that he was telling me about. I think I'm actually going to have Lou on the show to talk about this because he's really good at it. He's really good at talking with his friends who have a, an, a different point of view. And he really comes at it, as he does with many things, with humor. And um, it's now gotten to the point where some of his friends who are um, white conservative men who um, are very strong supporters of the president, and my husband is not, um, he will have conversations with them and, and they look forward now to talking with Lou because, you know, he's going to, they're, they're going to give each other, go well, back and forth. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Okay. It is I have those conversations a lot as long as I'm listening and asking. 
where it falls down is where the counter opinion is expressed. And so then once it becomes the two sides expressing their opinions, as opposed to one side listening and, and not trying to impose and not trying to argue, that part works well. Mm -hmm. Where it starts breaking down is, okay, so you tell me all these things that I disagree with, mm -hmm. then I tell you why I disagree. Right. I don't find in today's world right now that, that we make a lot of progress in that. Right. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I When I have them, I listen, ask some questions, and and certainly don't get try not to get judgmental. But maybe that's just a personal weakness on my part. I don't know that I can listen without expressing myself. Well, and I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, I marvel at him because I think he's so good at it. And, I, and I, I'm not. I mean, I, I've, I'm kind of like you um, in that sometimes if I'm having a... Um, a personal discussion with a friend who um, has an opposite point of view. I'm very passionate, and I, you know, tend to kind of go over the top, and that's not a good thing to do. Yeah, you know, the worst phrase that came out of the presidential race in 2016 uh, was the use of the word "the deplorable." Oh yes. And 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 yes. I don't even I need to go back ever to look and see what the context was. Is if she could be given credit for not having been it quite the way it was taken? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The people who disagree with us and the people who strongly support the president are not deplorable. No, not at all. And, 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 not and, at and, all. And that kind yes. of attitude toward people that disagree with us is uh, well, this one of the reasons they feel thing. so strong. Well, it is, and I and I certainly understand that. And um, I think one of our biggest problems is that we label each other. You know. The, the liberals, the leftists, the, you know, I mean, come on, you know, the, yeah. the, the right wing, blah, you know, the labels really need to stop. I mean, one we're of, all one of, yeah, people. One of, the, um, one of the things I always remember is my mother was very conservative. She was very, very interested in issues and all. And the two of us used to yell, particularly when I went to the Liberal Eastern University for college. I came back knowing everything about everything, obviously. <laughs> And uh, we would have these table arguments, and my my uh, brother, sister, and father would get up and leave the table, and my mother and I would argue into the late night. Uh, and so, but one of the things that was so advantageous to me is I, I knew and treasured somebody that I loved more than you could ever anyone could ever love anyone more than their mother when they're close to them who totally disagree with me about all these things. And so that's the big advantage I've had. I hope, in, in these polarized views, to have known and grown up with someone who has the same views but is, was a wonderful human being in just about every respect. So that's an advantage. Again, I go back to the advantage of growing up around people that disagree with you, that you, you love to love and respect and so on. And so that's the, uh, th that's the benefit I have from the way I grew up. And at the end of those um, our argumentative conversations with your mother, you, I'm sure, hugged oh, and kissed each other. Love you, Mom. Love you, Mom. And, and, then, and, and, then, yeah. and then the rest of the family looking in and said, are y'all through? You know. <laughs> wow. I love that. Well, I, I think there, you know, there are definitely some lessons there um, that hopefully our, our audience will take away. And I hope you weren't right in, in suggesting or in saying that, that some of our audience might have tuned out because of, of some <laughs> well, of what some of what they've heard. But the you know the whole point is that we have to be able to to have a, enough of a conversation to to get us to the other side. Yeah, and, and you know, as a trial lawyer, I'm gonna be asking regular everyday citizens, the kinds of very people I grew up with, to make difficult decisions. And if I don't have the ability to listen and recognize I don't have all the answers, they're going to sense it. You know, juries are a phenomenal uh, institution in this country. In fact, if you stop and think about it, think about a criminal trial. Criminal trial, as I grew up in as a prosecutor, and we still do criminal defense in addition to civil practice, we ask, I mean, criminal felony, we ask 12 people to come down who've never met and they're not going to be on the jury if they know anybody. We ask them to decide what happened based on what people they have never met, based on co legal concept a judge is going to give them that they've never thought about. And then we ask them to go back and unanimously agree to reason together and come to a unanimous conclusion based on an event they didn't see, they knew nothing about, 
from people they knew, did not know, uh, and they do it. And they do it every week in this country, all over the country. That's an incredible event if you stop and think about it. We could take a lot of lessons in our social living from the way juries operate, where they, where they have to meet with total strangers from every other background, every race, every sexual orientation, male, female, whatever, um, and they have to get together and go back and reason together based on a problem. The only thing they have in common that day is they heard the same evidence from people they didn't know. And, and, and if we, if we kind of think as we go through, you know, these difficult social issues and political issues, maybe it's not a bad lesson to remember. I've never thought about it from that perspective. That is, that's illuminating. Well, if you stop and think about it, yeah. the trial lawyer that gets mean uh, is abusive to the other person. We ought to remember how they, when we're looking at our political figures and everything, we ought to remember how juries generally react to lawyers who take advantage of somebody else and if they act like they're special in life. Um, and so they don't like it and it can affect their verdict. And though we're this this heated time in our society right now, we ought to remember at the end of the day, I'm absolutely convinced that the American public will quit rewarding meanness. They'll, they, you know, we have a lot of meanness going on right now, but in the long run, people will say they've had enough. We just have to wait it out. And, and the way juries react in a courtroom, uh, they, they always respect the most respected person in that courtroom is the judge in trials all over this country. So now that we have these very heated judicial situations and so we, we ought to remember average person in this country still respects the judiciary, still respects law and order and tries to do what's right. So we ought to just take the experience of a jury out into society at large. I'm wondering if over the last couple of years, if you've noticed any difference in juries, in how they're put together, I mean, based on kind of all the political discourse that's going on, has there been any change at all that you've noticed? Um, I don't want to draw too many lessons from it because it's a limited set, right. subset of, of examples. Mm -hmm. I think still, look, I just have tremendous faith in human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think when they come down, maybe they have privately heated political views, maybe they had the other. I'm always struck, and I think most judges would tell you this, because they talk to the juries after trial. I think, I think most people still, at heart, want to try to do what's right. And there may be some heated views going on and, and all that, but once it separates out and they realize they have another person or another company's future in their hands, I think they do everything they can I just still try to be fair. And I don't think that's changed. That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. Um, what do you think are common misperceptions that people might have about you? <laughs> well, I don't know what their perceptions are. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think that they assume uh, that if you represent somebody that's famous, then... Uh, then you must be a hugely wealth, wealthy person. Um, and I have a friend who's always kidding me about introducing me. And by the way, he doesn't have a plane, okay? <laughs> uh, I think they probably think that, uh, I think people think anyone who's famous is very full of themselves. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what perceptions. I've been lucky enough to make a very good living the last few years. And, um, but I would worked for the government until I was almost 50. So I was on a government salary until then. Um, I do live with a big concern. I take advantages of some degree of success now. Uh, I plead guilty to trying to fly first class when I can. Uh, we have a nice car. We have a nice house. Uh, you have tickets to the Rockets on the floor. Uh, floor seats for floor the Rockets. Floor seats for the Rockets. Um, and tonight, for the Warriors. <laughs> I think probably uh, one of my biggest fears is forgetting where I came from. So when we, when we are lucky enough to have some degree of financial success, uh, and particularly if you, your profession is what mine is, uh, dealing with uh, people about everyday matters and stuff and trying to persuade them of my point of view, 
my big fear is, is, is that I forget that uh, I'm still Rusty Harden that grew up with Agnes and Russell Harden in Monroe, North Carolina. Um, and uh, it, I'm not any more special than anybody else. And uh, I, I always am deathly afraid of forgetting that because if money allows you to live differently than the average person, you better be damn well sure that you don't take it too seriously. But I don't know what the perceptions are, so I can't address what the misperceptions are. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's very true, but I, I love what you just said about not forgetting where you came from. And, and I would venture to say that, you know, a lot of people who have seen you interviewed not only on local television, but national television based on some of the cases that you've, um, you've been involved with, um, have an idea that you're probably a very wealthy man and probably very full of yourself and probably, you know, people have those, those ideas. But the whole point is a lot of what you've shared with our audience today is probably something that they never would have attributed to you. Your humble beginnings, where you came from, your conservative mom, mm -hmm. you know. And father. And father. My, my mother just was more talkative than my father. But <laughs> Dad, they had, they had, Dad wasn't they, arguing with you, but you knew where he stood. They huh? had equal views. That's right. <laughs> I love it. Well, I, um, you know, I, I have really enjoyed getting to know you through the years. And I, I learned a lot about you just in this conversation because we don't usually, you know, talk about all of this stuff all the time. So um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come in and share your perspective. And uh, I, I share your your belief that that there's more good out there and that, you know, everybody, for the most part, we all want the same thing and we're all going to do the right thing. You know, uh, and, and, and I have to do a plug for Houston, okay? So we, we moved down here in 75. My wife is from Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I taught school in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, I went to Montgomery during the civil rights era. I arrived in Montgomery in August of 65. Selma, Montgomery was February of 65. So I was there 65, 66 before I went into the Army. Uh, it was a, that was a very heated time in our life and a very traumatic in our lives. Um, I knew a federal judge there. I taught his son that was really, Frank Johnson was probably the most important federal district judge in the country to the civil rights movement because of decisions he made that were later then affirmed by a higher court, the Fifth Circuit and stuff. And uh, it was a very, very heated time in our country. And uh, Houston, when we came here, we always thought we were going to go back to the East Coast originally when I was in law school. And then we decided to come down here because of the man who was the district attorney in Houston at that time, a guy named Carol Vance, a wonderful, wonderful guy, and a great prosecutor and district attorney. But this is, this is the most diverse city in the country now of any size. And, and the openness of this city, you know, somebody told me the difference in Dallas and Houston was in Houston, they don't ask you who your daddy was, all right? And, and that's a very, very true thing. And so we came down here, we didn't know anybody. Uh, so this city has been incredibly good to me and my wife and my family um, and to the multitude of various type of friends we have. If, if you come to Houston, you just have to work hard and, and, uh, and, and try to do good. And you're going to be fine. You may make a lot of money. You make no money. You may make a little bit of money. But you're going to be around a tremendous smorgasbord of people and attitudes. The rest of the country still doesn't realize that. They'll catch up to it. We're about to be the third largest city in the country, the next census, I think. We are the third largest county. Um, and this, this city has a tremendous amount to offer the rest of the country. And uh, I think as time goes on, people are right. One of its biggest virtues is, is, is that it is the, we want to keep it the open armed city that I think it has historically been. So I love being here. I, I wouldn't, if I made a billion dollars tomorrow, I wouldn't live anywhere else. I agree with you. I, I totally agree with you. And, um, uh, you know, Stephen Kleinberg is writing a book about this. Really? He is. He's writing a, writing a book um, about, um, Houston and and his surveys over the last 30 years and the fact that Houston is what the rest of the country will soon look like and there are a lot of things that can be learned and gleaned from the experience that that we're living as citizens of this community um, but I you know I grew up in Chicago and um, I love Houston and I, I don't ever see leaving here I really don't 
So well, don't keep yeah. doing more of this. Well, I'm going to keep doing more of this, and <laughs> um, and love being able to talk to people like you, and um, just sharing the the diverse perspectives, and just trying on a on a real you know grassroots level, just sharing people's stories, and and trying to get us all to to speak and listen with an open mind, and um, and hopefully it'll it'll take us in the in the right direction toward a more positive and a more civil discourse. Yeah, and if you look at at the impact the Astros had last year, and the Rockets had when they had good, teams, you know, athletic events sometimes can mirror the enthusiasm of a city. It's not like we go to bed wishing, thinking athletes are gods and everybody that's an athlete's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But the enthusiasm, and then you look at the cross section of the of the team and who they were ethnic, ethnically, and 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 how they impacted, and then look at who's, you know, who they're appealing to in the cross section. I mean, just about every ethnic group that exists, and uh, those kind of things kind of rise to the, make people feel good about looking around. I, I love walking around and looking at the variety of people that live in this town. And it's uh, it's super. And we used to be, it used to be like Manhattan. I picked a jury in Manhattan about, I mean, it's like Manhattan used to be. I picked a jury in Manhattan a number of years ago. And I was all concerned about my accent and how are they going to react to so on that. And they were wonderful. But the I counted thir- out of a jury panel of 60 people, I counted 27 different ethnic groups. Okay, mm. and that is now what Houston's like, and uh, nothing but good can come of that. Thank you, Rusty Harden. Joy, Pre- appreciate you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share some time with us today, and for giving Rusty permission to speak, and for having an open mind as you were listening. I know you <laughs> did, and I hope that you will continue to keep that open mind as you go forward about your day and throughout your life. Thanks for watching and for listening. We'll see you next time. If the mission of Our Voices Matter resonates with you, please like, subscribe, download, and share, and then join the conversation because it really is going to take all of us to make a difference.